For those of you guys that don't know me, my name is Tiffany Ward. I'm one of the pharmacy residents here at the VA. I'm actually a PGY2 that's specializing in infectious diseases. So today's presentation is going to be titled All Guts No Glory, and it's a review of the human microbiome and dysbiosis. This presentation was something I gave as my pharmacy grand rounds earlier in the year, back in August, I believe. And um, it was just a fun topic. It's got a lot of interesting things. It's not really pro-pharmacy, pro-medicine. It's just a lot of interesting facts. So there's going to be some questions throughout. Um, and I brought some cookies. So if you guys participate, you get cookies, mostly because I just wanted cookies. But um, just so all of you guys know, I don't have anything to disclose in giving today's presentation. And the learning objectives for today are to recognize the diversity and the significance of the human microbiome and describe the roles of the microbiome in the development of antimicrobial resistance, as well as evaluate the impact of antimicrobial therapy on the development of dysbiosis and then apply some recommendations for um, ut utilizing antimicrobial resistance or utilizing some strategies to prevent antimicrobial resistance and prevent dysbiosis. So just to give you guys a roadmap of um, what we are going to talk about, we're going to go through just some basic definitions. We're going to talk about what influences the microbiome, about this reservoir hypothesis that um, exists, what animal husbandry is, um, about probiotics, about antibiotic-induced dysbiosis, fecal transplants. I threw in a fun one, helminth therapy, which is all about hookworms, and um, then just how all of we can use antimicrobial stewardship to do all of this. So just to start off with a definition, the human microbiome is a collection of all the microorganisms living in association with the human body. So um, we know that our GI tract is completely colonized all the way through, and there's said to be about 10,000 microbes that live all the way through your digestive tract, um, which actually outnumbers our number of cells in our body by about tenfold. So there's a lot of bacteria in there. And they all work together to create this great ecosystem that is responsible for doing um, a lot of metabolism and biosynthesis of vitamins and neurotransmitters in the body. They're responsible for regulating endocrine functions, as well as just metabolisms of food items that we eat. Um, and so in 2008, the National Institute of Health, or the NIH, really thought that this was a topic that was something that was going to be important and up, and up and coming in the future years. So they established what's known as the Human Microbiome Project. It was geared to be similar to the Human Genome Project, and they wanted to map out what our microbiomes were like. Um, and so a lot of the studies that we'll go through and just some of the primary literature we talk about in the presentation, it was funded by some of the um, funding that came out of the Human Microbiome Project. Um, just so I thought it was a fun tidbit, and this is something that a lot of people are getting behind right now because it's just an interesting area of research. So to talk about the human microbiome and how it develops. So we develop, we're, you know, start out as infants and then we grow into adults and then we also age um, and things change all the way throughout that life, lifetime and along with that our microbiome changes. So if you start out um, in that infancy phase, um, babies are trying to, just like they're trying to learn to survive in this new environment that they're in, their microbiome is trying to s survive. They're increasing the functional capacity and it's starting to really increase the types of processes it can do, primarily metabolism becomes the big thing. In childhood, usually in kids that are about five years and older, you'll start to see that um, their functions stabilize, and you start to see a little bit of stabilization in the type and composition of what's in their microbiome, but they're still just growing and flourishing at that time. So it's kind of hits a plateau phase. But then when you hit adolescence, um, just like everything else changes, people are going through puberty and a lot of things change, your microbiome kind of revs up again and starts changing. And this time you start to see a lot more species in enrichment and even more biosynthesis pathways are, are showing up and a lot of things are changing. But then once you hit adulthood, that's when you're starting to separate yourself from other other people. So our microbiomes start to become unique from one another. And that depends on your environmental exposures, which we're going to talk about. And then on the tail end of this, just like with disease, um, elderly people tend to be more prone to disease and you may see, you know, just degener degenerative changes in their bone structure or anything as we age. And the same thing happens when we're elderly. So our microbiome starts to destabilize and you start to see decreases in the amount of diversity and functions of your microbiome, which could potentially be linked to some diseases, which is why this is such a huge area of research. 
So I mentioned that a lot of things influence the microbiome. So the first one um, to think about is your host genome. So our genetics do have an impact on what will be there, as well as the way our body's immune responses. So if you have autoimmune diseases, that might influence what type of bacteria grow in your GI tract. But those are kind of on the smaller end. The big ones that really, really help separate us out and make us all unique is our diets, the type of medications that we take in our environmental exposures. So there was, when I was doing a lot of the research for this, there was literature to support that diets high in vegetables may not really change a lot about our microbiome. It keeps it nice and homeostasis, whereas diets that are maybe higher in meats, especially red meats, can have an impact for bacteria that can cause a lot, maybe a little bit more GI upset or issues like that. So it's kind of interesting to think, you know, when your mom told you to eat your vegetables, maybe it really does help. Um, um, medications, the, primarily one, the primary one would be antibiotics, but other medications have been linked to changes in your microbiome, and we're going to talk about antibiotics specifically through the presentation. And then environmental exposures, there have been some links of the composition of your microbiome to diseases like allergy and asthma. Um, so if you're exposed to a lot of dust allergens, that may have some sort of impact on the composition that is there. So just to give you this idea of dysbiosis, it's in the title of my presentation, and I haven't really told you what that is. So dysbiosis is defined as the imbalance in the composition and function of our intestinal microbes. So this is what happens when we disrupt it. So you have this normal stabilization in the body, but if you induce something in there that can change that composition, you're going to get what they're terming dysbiosis. And so I think this figure does a really good job showing you what dysbiosis looks like. So here's your nice gut and nice homeostasis. Everybody's happy. But when you introduce something, let's say for an, an antibiotic, for example, you start to notice that you have a lot of these new bacteria that appear. So now they're red. They may be resistant to other organisms or something like that. The surface area of your intestine, intestines goes down. You notice that that has shrunk significantly. And you also see a lot of these inflammatory cells in the area that are also causing inflammation could lead to diseases like irritable bowel syndrome or something like that. Um, so um, other diseases that it has been proposed to be linked to is respiratory things. So I mentioned allergy, COPD. There have been some evidence that maybe atherosclerosis and other cardiovascular diseases are related to the bacteria in our GI tract, as well as liver disorders. So there's a lot of different things that are coming out of this, and we don't know all the answers. It's just interesting how much is tied to our microbiome. So first question. i got to get you guys to participate. It's easy. But dysbiosis of the human microbiome can occur due to changes in what? Is it A, the diet, B, your altered immune system, antibiotics, or exposure to dust allergens, or all of the above? You all get a cookie. There's sugar and chocolate chip for later. So thank you. But yeah, so super easy. All of the above, exactly. We talked about it. I made it easy for you guys. Um, so everything can have a big impact on it. So what I want to talk about is microbial resistance. So this is an ID talk. So I wanted to focus a little bit on the ID component of this. Um, so if we go on and we talk about the reservoir hypothesis. So what this is, is when you look at microbiome literature, it talks about how resistance can be transferred within our microbiome. And this hypothesis basically says that our, our intestines particularly are a reservoir for resistance and that's the term that's used but what is in the components of this are basically that bacteria can do three different things for in terms of resistance so they can share resistance among themselves so they're living happy in your intestines and they can pass plasmids or different times of DNA different types of DNA to one another just while they're sitting there you know living their lives in your intestines they can also acquire resistance genes from bacteria passing through the GI tract so let's say you ate some chicken or pork or something like that that was contaminated with bacteria, if any of those are carrying any of that bacteria that's passing through your GI tract carries resistance genes in that short period of time that it's there, those bacteria that do live in your gut can actually acquire some of that resistance. But then they can also donate resistance. So let's say the bacteria passing through doesn't have resistance genes, and but your microbiome does. They can donate some of their resistance to those bacteria passing through, and then when they get eliminated, potentially if you're contaminating some sort of surface, resistance can spread to other people. So those are the three ways, I think, of sharing, acquiring, and donating as the three ways that this can happen. And this is pretty basic. You guys probably recognize some different mechanisms of resistance. So there's just conjugation, which is similar to like the AMPC beta lactamases that you might see um, in some of our things. And that's a plasmid mediated approach. So plasmids are shown, let's see, where it's kind of, here's the plasmid. So it can just, you can have like 
direct connection between the two and the plasmid can just transfer over. You can also have just phage transduction, which is having like a bacteriophage released from a virus that can bring DNA to the bacteria, or just natural transformation, which is when a bacterial cell dies and DNA gets released into the environment and it can get taken up. And these are, this isn't all encompassing, but just some of the basic ways that this stuff can happen. The next thing I want to bring up is this idea of animal husbandry. So I mentioned that you can get resistance from the foods that you eat. So we do a lot of antimicrobial stewardship. We do a lot of things to reduce the amount of antibiotics we're using in humans. But a lot of the antibiotics that we use are actually used in food, the food industry, particularly with animals. So animal hus husbandry is defined as the science of breeding and caring for food animals. So this is... Basically what happens is farmers that have animals on site, they may feed their um, feed their cows, chickens, pigs, whatever, um, food that is enriched with antibiotics. And the primary goal of doing so is for growth promotion. That's why they give it. So they're giving sub-therapeutic doses to help make those animals bigger, stronger, so that when you go to the grocery store, you have this nice hefty steak or piece of chicken, chicken breast or something like that. But they do also use them for disease prevention and treatment. But for the most part, they put them in there for growth promotion. And what happens is if they're exposed to these antibiotics, resistance can develop, and then you can get exposed to that resistance from direct contact. So typically the farmers may, if they're working with the animals there, they can be directly exposed to the resistance, or it can be passed to you via the food chain. Um, and that's something scary. And just to give you the numbers, here is, well, that is pretty. That should say 20 and 80, where they are, I don't know. Um, but so 20% of antibiotics are used in um, humans, and then 80% are used in animals. So there's the vast majority of antibiotics are used outside of what we do. So it is everything that we're doing is important, but it's also important to think of this on a global scale as well. So I want to give you guys an example of a study because I'm just telling you all this information and I got to back it up, right? So there was a study done. I can't remember where this was done. I want to say it was in Germany. But basically what they did is they administered um, the pigs on a farm some, a diet of that consisted of these three antibiotics, one of which is penicillin, and they had two groups. So one group got the penicil the food enriched with antibiotics, one group didn't. And this is the what their microbiome looks like. So the way this is structured, you have the non-medicated group in these first two columns and the medicated group in the second two columns. But if you look at them at baseline um, at day zero, both groups are kind of similar, right? There's There may be a little variation, um, but for the most part, you have a pretty even consistency and everything's the same between the two. But if you look at days 14 and days uh, for the medicated and the non-medicated group, you'll really notice a lot of difference in the proteobacteria that's in their GI tract. So things are changing. And some of that proteobacteria that was actually identified in here as being really different between the groups was linked to resistance genes. Um, they went on further to look at the pigs that were involved in the study. And they did identify that the ones in the medicated group were significantly larger than the ones in the non-medicated group. But they also had a lot more resistance bacteria in their microbiome. So um, those results are shown here. So that was done at 14 days. So at the same time they ended this, you saw a lot more antibiotic resistance, but they were larger. So that comes with the trade-offs. We think that's bad because there's more resistance, but they're like, ooh, my animals are bigger. I'm going to get more money. So um, there's a lot to think about there. Second way to think about this is in patients that were... Um, this one was done in the Netherlands, and so what they did is they actually looked at the transfer from animals to humans this time. So they looked at chicken breast samples that were sold in the grocery store, and they tested all of the samples that were put in in the grocery store, and they identified that 98% of these samples had an ESBL-containing gene in them. So why they sold them, I don't know. But um, what they did is that after the patients bought the chicken breasts and they consumed them, they noticed that 35% of those human isolates, so their intestinal microbiomes, now contain ESBL genes. And when they did further sequencing, 19% were indistinguishable from the ESBL genes that came from the chicken. So maybe not all of them are coming from, you know, not all of that resistance is coming from the food, but some of it is, and there is evidence of transfer. So this shows that, you know, things can be passed from um, the food chain to humans, and ESBL genes are plasmid-mediated, so that could be one of the components, and we talked about that a little bit. And just to show you a map, um, this doesn't really pick out anything in particular, but it talks about E. coli resistance and how it's um, much, it's, it's growing and it's an issue. And so it's something that can also be passed in the food chain. So our national rates are about 7.5%, but um, in Florida, we're up at 8.9%, so we're a little bit higher. So it's just something to keep in the back of your mind that 
um, if we can do anything we can to reduce resistance rates, um, it would be a good thing. So we'll talk about how to do that. And then one last point to just bring it all home and give you an ex another real life example of this. Back in 2016, in May, um, a woman was identified to have the first MCR gene um, in the United States. When they went to investigate her, she was from Pennsylvania. She didn't have any recent travel outside of the US, which was our first thought. Um, she didn't have any exposure to livestock directly, but she had had a lot of recent hospital admissions, so they were concerned that maybe this was a hospital acquired thing. Um, and just so for those of you that don't know, MCR stands for mobilized colistin resistance, and colistin's an antibiotic that we primarily reserve for something last line. When you get to those pan resistant organisms, you're going to try to, you're going to reserve that, and that may be your last line option. And it is a plasmid mediated mechanism. So if you have a patient that has some pan resistant something else and you pass on that plasmid to that bacteria, now you may have something that's resistant to everything we know of. Um, but so what they did, the CDC did a lot of investigation because they were concerned that this had happened in the US. And they couldn't isolate it all the way down to the very last marker, but they did identify it that the MCR gene was linked to pork that she that came out of a farm either in South Carolina or Illinois. So it did come from the food. So it does happen. Um, and luckily she, it wasn't pan resistant, it was just resistant to colistin. So she was able to be treated. She's, as far as I know, healthy, as far as the last news story. But it does happen. And so it's, it's a scary thing, but it's also just interesting to be aware of. So second question, this one's a mouthful, but I'll read it for you guys. Antimicrobial resistance can be shared between the bacteria in the environment. It can be acquired from bacteria passing through the GI tract. However, bacteria from the GI tract can't donate resistance um, to those passing through the GI tract. Is that true or false? Exactly. So it can do all three. We talked about that. So the three things um, just to think about, they can share, they can acquire, and they can donate. So this brings me to our middle topic, which is going to be antibiotic-induced dysbiosis. So how can antibiotics impact this, and what do we need to be concerned about from this standpoint? So the CDC um, put out this image, and I thought it was really, really good depiction of what happens in dysbiosis. I know we've mentioned it before, but I'll bring it up again. So think about your microbiome as a forest. It's in this nice ecosystem. Every, everything's living in harmony. You have flowers, plants, trees. Everything's happy. But let's say you give a patient an antibiotic. It's going to wipe out everything that's there. It's almost like lighting a fire in that forest, and you're just going to take out everything in that general area. So good, bad, whatever it may be. Um, and then what happens is you have to get to that recovery phase where patients are, where your microbiome is starting to grow back. But a lot of times, only things that can survive in really harsh environments grow there. So in our microbiome, this may be things that are resistant. Um, and so you, that becomes what's, what's taking over that environment. And that becomes your new normal. And that's this last phase is when the overgrowth of your infection or your resistant bacteria become your new normal. And then you go on to have issues um, that way, and you maybe now have, you're colonized with resistant bacteria that could potentially cause an infection in the future. And so this is like a cycle that goes on and on and on. And so just to give you an idea of um, what can cause and what affects antibiotics and how, how we should be concerned about them, our more broad spectrum antibiotics are going to have a higher risk of causing dysbiosis because they're impacting more types of bacteria they're covering. You may have something that's covering gram-negative anaerobes and gram positive, so you're wiping everything out, basically. Um, if you talk about the pharmacokinetics of a drug, so you really think about the absorption. If a drug is being, it takes a long time to be absorbed, or it hangs around maybe in your GI tract longer, or has active metabolites that are excreted through the bile, you may be at a higher risk for have it causing dysbiosis because it's spending more time in that physical area. The next thing to think about is the dose. So I talked about subtherapeutic doses in animals. The same thing applies to humans. If you're not giving them enough of a dose to take care of their infection, you can cause more harm than good because, yeah, you're disrupting the microbiome, but you're also allowing some of the organisms to get used to that thing and inducing resistance. So making sure you're giving a good, adequate dose. The route of administration, as of right now, um, the literature supports that every single route of administration does induce dysbiosis. So just because you're giving it IV doesn't mean that it's not getting to the GI tract. There were a couple studies I came across that may suggest that oral therapy, um, since it does get absorbed inside of your GI tract, could 
increase the risk of dysbiosis a little bit more, but it was really only in one study, so it hasn't been supported. So as of right now, the recommendation still is if you can get a patient on IV or oral therapy, that is still the best option because any of it can cause dysbiosis. And the last thing is duration of therapy. So making sure that you're giving patients a not like the shortest duration possible to cure their infection and not leaving it on forever. Um, I had a good picture and I must have forgot it to put it in the slide um, or it's in a different version. But basically what it does is you have your normal microbiome and then once you're exposed to antibiotics you wipe everything out and it shows you that Basically, if you're on antibiotics for longer periods of time, the amount of time it takes for your microbiome to grow back is so much significantly longer than if you give shorter durations. I mean, we're talking years and years here that your micro until your microbiome comes back to what it originally was. The other things to think about, so that's more drug related. If you think about the patient, though, there are factors that can influence it, and this can be, um, it's Dysbiosis is probably more common in your critically ill and neutropenic patients, and the reasons for that are because they have increased intestinal permeability. So their intestines are a lot more inflamed, um, so that you're at risk for translocating bacteria either from the gut or maybe from the bloodstream into that area, which can cause a lot more disruption as well. They also may have slowed gut transit. So if you do have antibiotics that are lingering in the bile or excreted that way, if you're not you know, if your gut transit has slowed down, it's hanging around even longer. So that could be a problem. And then the last thing is we just know that patients that are critically ill are at higher risk for developing hospital-acquired infections in general. So if you develop an infection, you need antibiotics, and that cycle starts over again, so they're more at risk for dysbiosis. So I spent a lot of time, and what I really wanted to get out of this presentation is which antibiotics will cause dysbiosis more than the others, and which ones, you know, maybe should I avoid? Um, and I really couldn't find a strong answer for that, but I did find this, um, I put together this table from everything that I found, um, and it talks about maybe which bacteria may you know, overgrow or which ones may disappear. But the part that I want to focus on is the recovery part. So there wasn't a lot of data for every single one, but it takes, this is how long it takes for your microbiome even to think about recovering after finishing a course of therapy. So if we look at penicillins, you're talking, you get, you finish your course, let's say you're on it for seven to 10 days. So 10 days, 14 days after that, your microbiome might start to come back and you can still have residual effects from it. Um, with cephalosporins like ceftrioxone, it was linked to about a month later. Um, I thought clindamycin was interesting that it was only 14 days just because it has a higher C. diff risk, but you can definitely see that it takes a long time for your microbiome to start even recovering, and this isn't talking about when does it get recovered. Um, this is just how long it starts to develop. So once again, I want to give you some primary literature and some things to think about and where, where some of this information is coming from. Um, this study actually looked at the impact of patients that were taking clarithromycin containing regimens for H. pylori. It was a really small study, only six people were included. But what they noticed is in these patients when they did sequencing of their microbiome that they had an a thousand fold increase in ERM resistance genes, which we've proven that you're gonna if you're exposed to it, you're at higher risk for resistance. But what the interesting part was they followed these patients and did sequencing um, for quite a long time later. Um, they were checking it basically every year. And they noticed that they developed this resistance lingered in their GI tract for four years, and even at four years was about when they started to see their microbiome starting to come back after just a single 14-day course of clarithromycin for H. pylori. So we're talking, like I said, talking years and years here for these patients. The next study to give you a little bit more evidence about this, this one actually compared your oral microbiome, my, microbiome versus your gut. So you're colonized all the way through, but what they noticed was that in patients that took antibiotics, their diversity of their microbiome in the oral cavity um, after like ciprofloxacin or even clindamycin, I think they even looked at amoxicillin in, this, in that component, but it was only affected for like a week, um, and then it just bounced right back right back. But when you look at your your like GI tract, your gut, and your fecal contents, those um, the diversity of your microbiome lingers and stays reduced for four months with clindamycin, 12 months in this study for Cipro. So um, it's definitely, the impact is not necessarily all the way through. It's definitely in your, your gut microbiome. So I have to give you a break. I'm going to let you guys read all of the answers to this one. But which of the following is correct regarding the impact of antimicrobial therapy on the human microbiome? Ideas? 
Nobody wants to. D. Yep. D. Exactly. So we 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 said earlier that all of the routes will do it. So it doesn't. IV is really not the big one, but any of this stuff can happen. So this brings me to my last part, and I want to spend the bulk of the presentation, so this will be the bulk of today's discussion on prevention and preventing dysbiosis and what can we do. And this is going to focus on non-pharmacologic things. Um, it's going to focus on pharmacologic things, what we can do as pharmacists, as physicians, um, and also how other specialties can get involved as well. So um, the areas we're going to talk about are infection control, probiotics, fecal transplants, um, helmet therapy, which is kind of fun. I don't know. It was an interesting one I came across. And then antimicrobial stewardship, and we'll bring it home with that. Um, so if we talk about infection control, both um, the CDC and the World Health Organization make recommendations for um, what we should do in terms of infection control to prevent the spread of resistance or infections across the board. And I think we are all probably very familiar with all of these. You know, wash your hands before you go in and out of the room. Um, personal protective equipment, if you have one of those signs out front that requires a mask or a gown, just gowning up just so that you're not transferring anything between patients. But I think the ones that stick out to me the most here are more the things of environmental cleaning and changing of bed sheets and bed linens as well as appropriate waste disposal and cleaning patient care equipment. So we all know what we have to do when we go in and out of those rooms but there's other specialties especially our environmental group that is responsible for cleaning the rooms and their their job is very important to preventing some of these things and the spread of resistance. So I think that's something just to keep in the back of your mind is it's not just us that have to do everything it's in a giant team of us and a big group that has to be involved in this. And we won't go through this um, but I included it just as a sample of hand hygiene. I I think we've all seen the diagram of how to do it so if you guys really want to at the end of the presentation I can come back to this. But the next thing I want to talk about is probiotics and where where things stand with probiotics. So the goal is to maintain and restore gut homeostasis and we can do it by the oral route but the problem is that there's so many different forms of probiotics. So there's lactobacillus by phytobacterium, there's Saccharomyces boulardii which is like a yeast based probiotic and we really don't have an answer to to where this stands and I'm not going to be able to answer all of that for you but I can tell you what the literature says and hopefully we can come up with a good um, answer and I looked at a couple other studies in preparing for this as well so we can talk about some of that but this one actually looked at a very specific strain of an E. coli probiotic um, it looked at 69 patients that were in a long-term care facility that had multi-drug resistant E. coli in their urine or feces was how it was identified and the probiotic strain they used was called Nissel 1917 I don't think we have it here, but it was interesting because this was one of the few studies that I found that really picked one probiotic to look at. Um, and what they saw, they split it into two groups, a probiotic group and a placebo group. And what they saw was that there was no, dif no significant difference in your resistance rates in patients that received this probiotic. So it really wasn't making a difference, at least in, in resistance for that matter. Um, then if we talk about the differences with maybe C. diff therapies. So these two charts, um, I know they're a little bit small, but basically what it does is this first chart represents a cohort of patients that had just, you know, baseline, no exposure to antibiotics. This is their normal fecal microbiome. So there's not a lot of things in there. It's pretty stable. And this represents the microbiome of a patient that has um, that has been exposed to C. diff therapy or antibiotics or has an active infection going on. So I highlighted the um, the total amount of like faculta facultative and obligate anaerobes and gram-negative bacilli that are in the area. And then I also highlighted this, which is lumped in in that same category. I don't know why they did that. The charts are, it's a study. I couldn't control it. But you'll notice that, so here it says 7.2 and 8.9, and that says 9.5. So those actually stayed the same between the two groups, whether they had an active infection or had been exposed to it. So this is where a lot of the idea came from that maybe we should use lactobacillus strains for probiotics. And that is what we have here is a mono strain of lactobacillus as our probiotic, but there's a lot of different options out there. Um, and so I have one more study to talk about, and this one looks at how, what therapies we could use to potentially prevent C. diff in patients. So it was specialized more to one disease. The first one is Lifeway Kefir or Kefir, um, however you pronounce it. Um, I know this is something that we've recommended for patients on ID consults. I've seen this done before. Um, this one was actually studied in patients that had recurrent C. diff and about what they did is they had six weeks of metronidazole or vancomycin that was tapered 
um, but they added on this Lifeway Kefir that was given as three drinks a day. So they could have taken all three at one time or three times a day. They didn't really measure how they were taking them, but it was three daily. And what they saw is patients that had the combination of the two had complete resolution of their C. diff um, in 84% of the cases, which was pretty significant really to see a big difference. Um, and then on top of that, they mentioned that there were no complications, so no infections from being exposed to this or no issues. Um, and then the second thing that this study looked at was they, they lumped in two different types of probiotics, and then there was this BioK plus. And BioK is a combination of multi-strain lactobacillus formulation. I, I know we don't have it here. I don't know, I don't know if you guys know, do, do the other hospitals that you work out use BioK? Oh. Yeah, I when I did rotations as a student, there were a couple hospitals that this was their formulary thing, so I thought it stuck out. I know we don't have it, but. And that's what that's what this will this will actually say. So there was a hospital in Canada that had this massive increase in C diff. Yeah. So massive increases, and what they decided is we have to do something about this. Like if our C. diff infection rate is so high, what can we do? So they introduced BioK to any patient that was on an antibiotic. Um, it was started between 2 and 12 hours before, like within antibiotic therapy, and continued for at least 30 days, regardless of duration. Now if duration was longer, they continued it until the antibiotic was stopped. And what they reported is that they had their C. diff incidence decreased to 2.3 cases per 10,000 patient days from 18. Um, cases per 10,000 patient days. So that's a pretty significant decrease, and it's saying 39%. So that's where all this evidence for BioK and giving probiotics at the same time as patients. Um, so those are the primary literature I've reviewed. But since I've given this presentation in August, I did read up on a couple more meta-analyses that really talked about different things. So just to give you a heads up of what else is out there, um, a lot of the issues with a lot of the literature is that they are lumping together patients that have um, both prime, like uh, that are used for primary prevention versus secondary prevention of a C. diff infection. And so when you lump them together, we aren't really able to identify when we should use this, when in the course um, we should use it. Nothing has been standardized in terms of dosing or the formulation to use. Um, nothing has been standardized in terms of the um, frequency, like how long, how many times a day should we dose, how long should we give it, and so that those are a lot of the issues, and that's what comes up in every single one of these meta-analysis, and if we got on Google right now, I swear to you, I could pull up as many studies that say to use probiotics as to not use probiotics. The other thing to think about in these patients is who they, in, in all these studies, is who they excluded. Um, so they excluded patients that were primarily immunocompromised, patients that were pregnant, patients that maybe had baseline GI disorders like irritable bowel syndrome, and and I said, did I say immunocompromised? So that was the big groups. So, and the reason they exclude those patients is because there's concern of the adverse effects. So in an immunocompromised patient or maybe a critically ill patient, um, I talked about how they may have increased um, permeability of their GI tract. So if you're giving them an active probiotic, is there a risk for bacteremia? And some of the studies comment on it and some don't. Um, so right now, I wish I had a really good answer for you know whether or not probiotics are recommended. But right now, the evidence is increasing. There's a lot more out there. Um, just since I gave this presentation, I saw way more studies that I didn't see the first time. But everything still remains mixed. So the thing is, we really, I've mentioned, we need to determine you know what to use and when to use it. But I think the end goal is, I think in certain patients, it's definitely worth a shot to try. If you're getting to the point where you don't have anything else, like, and, and they really aren't one of those high-risk patients, they aren't immunocompromised or pregnant or something like that, it's worth a shot. I mean, it, it's shown, all these studies are showing no issues, um, but they just may not have studied it in those settings. Did you come across when you were looking at these, that there has been like a case report of bacteremia, secondary to probiotics, that was directly linked to like gut inflammation? I know there's been a few I didn't see any that were directly linked to just gut inflammation in critically ill patients, but you can pull up a lot of case reports of bacteremia linked to, yeah, lact like lactobacillus. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see anything from that swelling.
But so that's that's the issue. And and since there is no answer, and when you read the studies, it's really funny. There's like one paragraph that says, you know, no no adverse effects, and like they don't. There's nothing that's really studying the safety either. So there's just a lot of things to think about. So my answer now is just you know think of it case by case and see what to do. So I hope that helps. The next thing is fecal transplants. So fecal transplants, I think, I assume most of you guys have seen one, right, or done one? Okay. Um, so the goal is basically to reachieve a good colonization in your GI tract and get you back to a baseline. And it's done, um, it can be done by, while well, you're giving fecal flora to a patient, it can be done via like an upper um, exposure, so down a GI tube, but you can also do it lower, which would be like a retention enema type um, procedure. And what it's been shown and proven to do at this point is it does decrease the rates of C. diff, um, and it's become something that we are using more frequently in patients that have severe recurrent C. diff. But its role in other conditions is starting to be studied a lot more, and we really don't know where it's going to play a role there. So it might be something we're doing more frequently for other things. But if we look at it particularly for C. diff, because that's where it's studied right now, this was a meta-analysis that included 11 studies. None of them were randomized controlled trials, so everything was observational. But there was a total of 230 or 273 patients um, that did have C. diff that were treated with um, fecal transplants, and they found that about 90% of those patients had clinical resolution of their C. diff, which is really, really high, and it's become a really good um, option for these patients. The thing that I thought was interesting for this was that lower GI um, administration of the fecal transplant, so via a retention enema, actually had slightly higher rates of resolution compared to our nasogastric administration. I know we're doing it all upper right now. Um, this is the only time I've ever seen that commented. I tried to find other studies that supported it as well, um, but that might be something that comes out in the literature in the future, that there may be a procedure that's preferred over the other. I know when you're doing it lower, it takes a lot more time than doing it upper, so there's a lot of pros and cons to it. But basically, we know now that it holds consistency considerable promise for recurrent C. diff infections, and, you know, it would be good to see randomized control trials to support it, but I don't know that anybody will pursue that, and I'm anxious to see what the new C. diff guidelines say, like where it falls in therapy as well. Is that a CSP trial? That's oh, is it? Oh, good. That's even more interesting. Maybe you don't have to get a tube. Capsules that, are better. Is that lower delivery via endoscopy or retention enema? It was enema yeah. in this one, yeah. Um, so it was just interesting to see that, like, maybe, it ha I don't know if you're, since it's right there, I have no idea um, how it's working. So then this brings me to, I mentioned that it might have a role in other diseases, and I've touched on this throughout the presentation, but there's this theory of crosstalk with our microbiome, and that it's linked to a bunch of these different diseases. I mentioned asthma and COPD earlier. Um, I mentioned inflammatory, inflammatory bowel disease, atherosclerosis. Another one that's interesting is obesity, and I think this one was proven, actually, um, there was a case of a patient that received a fecal transplant from somebody that was obese, and they actually... Um, went up on the BMI scale to the obese class, and they gained a lot of weight after the fecal transplant. So it may be something that is linked to our microbiome. Now, that was a case report of something happening, so whether or not that stands true or whether or not you're getting irritable bowel syndrome, but it's something that is out there and, and thoughts for patients, and that's why that human microbiome project exists, and that's why we're doing all of this research. But what's cool is I did find this one study where they gave fecal transplants in patients that had blood disorders. Um, and what they saw was in, in the patients that had um, these different blood disorders. Um, I can't even remember what they all are, sorry. But um, patients had complete decolonization, like 75% of the time. And basically, when they did that, they at, at um, when they did that, they concluded that these patients, the blood disorders, their frequency of having issues with it and coming to the hospital for their issues diminished by quite a significant amount, about 75%. And they found it safe in these patients. There were no episodes of bacteremia. There were no issues. Um, and their GI tract was completely colonized, and they had eliminated their diseases. And there's things coming out about using them in patients with irritable bowel syndrome or something else. But this was just one I found that was fairly recent um, that I thought was interesting. So then this brings me to our hookworm section, which was something else that was super cool. Um, I don't think we'll ever do this here, but I just thought it was fun to talk about. Um, so what this does is the goal is to introduce these infectious hookworms into the GI tract to actually help develop the immune system and reduce inflammatory markers. So what they've shown is actually that patients that may have been exposed to these worms may have less risk of 
um, inflammatory diseases or even, you know, a little bit stronger immune system to fight it. So it seems kind of weird. I don't think I would want to be given it to it, given a hookworm. But what they do is they basically give them the eggs. I think so. But I don't, yeah, but they give them the eggs. Mm -hmm. Still, I don't know if I could be okay with this. And then the properties that are in the ova will actually help, hopefully, induce these issues. And so it has in improved the richness of the microbiome. It hasn't really, so it, they're starting, there's more of the good bacteria present, but diversity hasn't really gone up using it and whatnot. So where it stands in practice is interesting. But this one, um, what they looked at was they actually looked at 51 patients from Malaysia, um, and about 70% of them were just naturally colonized with these helminths. And um, what they identified was that they just looked at the microbiome of the two of the groups that had it and didn't. And what they saw is the patients that were exposed to these hookworms had just a greater diversity and their bacteria just was like they were healthier overall compared to the patients that hadn't been exposed, which is super weird. Um, so, and it was associated with this Trichuris type. So there's different types of hookworms, but that was the species that actually was associated with more richness and more diversity compared to the others. So then that started getting them thinking like, does this have a role? Like, why are these people healthier? Um, and so they looked at patients that, um, they used it actually in patients that had um, gluten allergies, basically. And they exposed patients to these ova, and there were only eight patients included. So once again, really, really small. Um, and they identified that there was no significant difference in the diversity between the patients that had been exposed to the ova, but they did have an increase in bacterial richness, about 50% two weeks afterwards, so whether that has a role in preventing diseases um, or not, um, and that was also in at both 36 and 52 weeks. But the other component to this was, so what they did is they exposed the patients to it and they were increasing the amount of gluten in their diet. Um, so I didn't include it on here because I just wanted to focus on the hookworms, but they did increase the amount of gluten in their diet every single day, and all eight of the patients were able to um, tolerate gluten in their diet without it. So whether, it may not have a role in like C. diff or something like that, but it, I don't know if, I, I don't know. I just thought it was really cool and I was like, this seems strange. And then the last thing to really talk about is antimicrobial stewardship. So this brings it home to what we do on an every single day basis. I know some of us are on consults or you rotate through the stewardship program. Um, but right now where it stands that antibiotics are fantastic drugs. They reduce mortality. They prevent um, infections and they're great, but they don't come without the consequences that we know about. And right now the estimate from the CDC is that 20 to 50 percent of antibiotics are unnecessary or inappropriate. So that could be they're giving them for things that aren't bacterial infection or they're giving the wrong dose or the wrong duration of therapy. And so that has an Impact. We've talked about that before. And so what this does is it just provides no clinical benefit for the patient. So you're just giving them more side effects. You're not making them feel better potentially. And you're increasing the risk of those adverse reactions. You're increasing resistance. And you're increasing healthcare costs if they come back in for types of infections. Um, and so what we can do, um, the goal of antimicrobial stewardship programs, I think you guys have heard this before. Jayla gave a talk on it earlier this year. But the goal of a stewardship program is to optimize clinical outcomes for patients and minimize the unintended consequences consequences. So exactly that. And one of the unintended consequences would be dysbiosis or disrupting that microbiome. Um, and so we can do that through, you know, just following, you know, making sure you're reviewing what medications you're prescribing the patients, restricting certain formulary things so they're not getting these crazy broad spectrum last line agents that we shouldn't be using, educating patients and providers. So that's, I think, the key part is patients also need to know not to walk into the doctor's office and say, I need an antibiotic. Um, and so that's a big component. And then just following the guidelines, they're there for a reason. They recommend durations of therapy. And sometimes you do have to go on it, but document why you're doing that um, so that everybody can can understand that. And so these are um, a list, and I had these in here mostly for when I gave this as my pharmacy grand rounds so that the pharmacist would understand what we do on an every single day basis. Um, but so you can just, um, these are ways that we can do stewardship. Um, I think the big one to focus on is just avoiding the unnecessary use of antibiotics. Um, I think if we can get patients on, off of them um, when they don't need them, I think it's a great thing and it's reducing their risk of exposures um, to dysbiosis and complications. And I know we don't know where all of that fits in therapy. It's just an interesting topic to know about, know that there's a lot of research out there and something may change because of it.
Um, and then I just want to tell you about this patient case that was really interesting, and I think it brings it home to our VA. So if you're practicing here, um, it's something that has gotten close to home. So there was a 45-year-old female patient that did travel to India. She was unfortunately involved in a motor vehicle accident, and she um, is now a C4 to 5 quad. And she spent one month in New Delhi Hospital when she was over there. Um, she, she did end up having the tracheostomy placed, and she came here. And she had subsequent infections, but she ended up being colonized um, in her lungs with pseudomonas. And if you look at this, this is one of her pseudomonas cultures. Um, they're all ours, so they're all resistant. So it does happen. Um, and so think about that mobilized colistin resistance, like if she picked up a plasmid or something in that patient. Like that's scary that we get to that point. So doing all of this is important because it is moving closer to home. And not this doesn't happen in every single patient. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm. Mm hmm. So, and then, it, and then they come back here, and then you're, it's here. And so it's just something that's out there. And whether, think about, we talked about the food products. Like, where does the food come from? Is it coming from other countries that are potentially bringing things in? Um, and so it does happen. So then I have one more question for you guys, and I decided to make it case-based so we can apply all of our knowledge, okay? So we have a 65-year-old male that's admitted to the hospital with their third recurrence of C. diff. There is their meds and past medical history. But the things are, so he was treated with flagell the first go-round um, for 10 days. His second occurrence, he got Vanco for 14 days. And his third occurrence, he got 14 days of Vanco followed by a taper. Um, and so now my question for you, shouldn't be too, too terrible, but select all of them that you think would be a good option for treating this. Or what can we do? And that's, speaking of the reason I did that, so everything but D. Like, D was just a fun one for us to learn about, but I don't think it has a role in therapy just yet. But we can definitely apply all of our infection control um, to that. So this brings me, just to tuck it all in and give you guys some take-home points, we know that the human microbiome is really important and it's linked to everything pretty much in our bodies. Um, and it's it's a little community that lives inside of us, kind of kind of creepy actually, don't, don't listen to that. Um, and the human microbiome is influenced by our genetics, our immune system, what we eat, what medications we take, and what we're exposed to in our day-to-day -day life. Um, and so it is a reservoir for resistance, so utilizing some of those infection control strategies will help prevent transplantation transmission of that. And we know that dysbiosis may have a significant impact on the development of diseases, whether they're infectious or non-infectious. So it can have a role in multiple places. But right now, where it stands, antimicrobial therapies are number one risk factor for having this happen. So by minimizing the exposures of unintended antibiotics, we minimize that because we don't know the long-term effects of having dysbiosis um, in our patients and what diseases it can be. Um, linked to. So that just brings me to antimicrobial stewardship is our is our best way right now. And, and the reason I keep pointing that out is because that's one of my favorite things. That's what drew me to ID is the stewardship component and what we can do every day to help patients and educate them um, to hope that they have the best